The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Tonight's message is on the danger of counter-dependence. Everybody knows what codependence is, or at least they have an idea what it is. Counter-dependence is when you never need anyone. Does this sound familiar? Anybody you know? Have you ever done this yourself? I don't need anybody. I can do it all by myself. All right. So the conviction's already being emanating in this room, so who knows what's going on in Ustream already. But anyway, the dangers of counterdependency. I want to get to the solution, but I want it to be understood uh, from a spiritual context uh, rather than a psychological context. If we wanted psychology, I would call Jennifer, who's got her degree in it, uh, up here for that. But I saw the pattern. That's just what the world calls it. But the pattern is something you've seen in individuals' lives. Codependency, that's the habit of gaining self-worth uh, needs met by pleasing other people. And it's something most people know of nowadays, codependence. It's, it's literally getting your self-worth, worth, uh, getting those needs met by being a people pleaser or getting it from people, getting your needs met from people but a lesser known opposite called counterdependency uh, can be just as much of a problem and it is often related to codependency. In fact, some people, uh, sometimes a person will even switch from one extreme to the other in a relationship. It's a pull-push type thing. Uh, a codependent rescues somebody to feel good about themselves. And they need to be a rescuer. They need to be uh, rescuing somebody. And a lot of times they pick on someone that doesn't want rescued. Um, but they begin to resent the person for taking on too much of their time. I used to see it as a pastor where people wanted to be people helpers. But every time they went and helped somebody, I had to listen to them badmouth the person on how much time they were taking out of their life. And I'm going... Something's missing here. Why do it then? If you're just going to complain and talk bad about somebody that you're supposedly investing in, you know, uh, what, what's, the, what's the issue here? Uh, they're just taking too much from me. They're just pulling on me in all different ways. You're the one rescuing them. You're the one looking to help them all the time. But a counterdependent likes the attention, but then he can feel or she can feel smothered and begin to push away. So in many ways, uh, counter-dependency anyway, uh, is a fancy word for, and this is the way you're going to see it more in the body of Christ, not psychology. Counter-dependency is basically fear of intimacy. That's it in its simplest form. And it's always been my concern because I'm seeing all of Christianity is built on a relationship. There's no such thing as not being a people person, it's relationship. And people will have a tendency, counter-dependent people, you might, uh, you might be as religious as all get out, but if, if you don't have the walls drop down for an intimate relationship with God, you're just into religion. All right, but let's 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 define it first, and then I'll, then we get to the solution. All right, uh, if the real issue is fear of intimacy, those who suffer counterdependency have a dread. They are so independent they dread having to need anybody. So it's a fear-based thing, but I don't want to ever need anyone. That's at the heart of their inability would be my Bible word, trust. They have a trust problem. So they come across as 
their theory in theory is I don't ever want to depend or need anybody. And we see the root problem there is just a trust issue. If there was a belief that all counter dependents have, it would probably be I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone. If that's really locked into their personality, they're going to have a real trouble with just the basic gospel when you think about it. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't need anybody. Okay, signs of a counter-dependent. Now remember, we're not talking codependent, we're talking counter-dependent. This is the other side. And many times, it's in our series, isn't it, Jennifer? In our the tangled web of codependency, we do cover counterdependency. But I wanted to spend more time on it just tonight, counterdependence. Because again, my concern is for anyone in the body of Christ is to fear intimacy is to put an automatic wall between you and God. And then the only thing you got left is an empty shell of religion. And religion can be easier because you can make your own rules and regulations and look really externally righteous but never really get close to anybody. And you can fool people by even being a people helper and still be counter-dependent. All right, here's some signs of a counter-dependency. They can often come across as vibrant, life of the party, the kind who have many friends and many relationships. They probably got 3,000 friends on Facebook and maybe no nobody, all right, closely. The difference is in those relationships, they will not be deep, trusting, or long-lasting. So one of the main signs of a counterdependent is an inability to have connected and authentic. Those are two key words. Just write those two words. Connected and authentic. Connected and authentic, spirit-to-spirit relationships, vulnerable relationships. Uh, And one of the things I noticed over the years in the pastorate, for those that I would say have a fear of intimacy or a uh, uh, counter-dependent relationship, is they could appear to be helping a lot of people, but I was always suspicious when I says, how come this person that wants to minister to everybody in my church has never gotten vulnerable and let me minister to them. That was my red flag. If you're so people-oriented and you are so passionate about helping people, how come you've never made yourself vulnerable to me? Yet you want to minister to all of the people that are in my congregation. It's, It's a red flag. And then when they do help people, they have a tendency to come back with just the negative. They don't come back with good reports of redemptive changed lives. They come back with how difficult they are, which makes them look better, how difficult they are and how time-consuming they are and what a, how they're just imposing on my time. What a waste. So these signs of that inability to connect and have authentic relationships Those are two words. I should have wrote that down for those that are watching by Ustream. Failure to connect and authentic relationship. If you don't have an authentic relationship, what do you have? a make-believe relationship, one that is in appearance only, a failure to connect spirit to spirit. All right. Now, I'm going to list about a dozen things here. I want you to kind of just, uh, you're not going to be able to write 12 things, but I'm going to list the 12, 12 ways of identifying and just let it sink in until you get kind of a picture. All right. Uh, they are seemingly good at relating, but they have a point or a wall where it stops. They seem to be good, life of the party, 
but there's a wall where it stops, where you know you can't get close. Secondly, they, there's a feeling of being trapped in relationships. They'll be complaining that they're trapped. There's no room. I can't breathe. Everybody hovers. Husband or wife, he's always there. Feeling trapped in relationships. Pushing people away or going cold without warning. They fear abandonment or rejected. So abandon or reject first. Okay? They might have one short relationship after another. Because of the inability to trust, they're going to reach out, but they'll keep it short. There's a tendency to date needy overgivers. This is interesting because they make a couple very often. They're looking for needy over codependent people. They want to rescue them because then they can not be attached, not connect, not have an authentic relationship, but use them because they spot the need in them to be needed. And they will use and abuse. And I've seen that in all the years of ministry so many times. And uh, people have to want help because they can find a comfort in this, even though it's not authentic and it's not real. They find a false security in it. All right? So the tendency to date needy overgivers, or what they would call codependent. Uh, they might have different personalities for different people to avoid being seen. In other words, uh, I used to call it like the chameleon. Um, they can change based on the arena they're in and act accordingly to what you think might be expected without me being vulnerable. They can act overly talkative, overly confident in, a, in an area where they are afraid they might be exposed. It it's, it's comes from really uh, one of the things I'll cover it later, but pride does that. Pride Always, I can see it uh, in, from pastoral counseling. Pride will agree to assistance. This is worth writing down. Pride will agree to assistance, but not surrender. I'll go for counseling, but I am not going to yield, and I'm not going to let anybody know me. But I'll go and give the appearance of asking for help. That makes me look good. All right? Write that down because pride is a problem in the counterdependent person uh, as it is in, in anybody's life. But uh, pride that will agree to assistance, you know, what the, you know what the downside of that is? If pride will agree to assistance but never really surrender, then when it doesn't work, they have an excuse. It was, they couldn't help me. I saw so many people that it would have been so easy to help. And then said, well, I went to that church, but they couldn't help me. And it was like, you didn't, you didn't do anything when it came to being vulnerable at all. So it's easier for you to say they couldn't help me than it was to be vulnerable. Counterdependence will say that. So don't be upset when you, when you uh, minister to somebody and they say you can't, uh, they couldn't help me. Very often that's just an excuse. They never got vulnerable enough. All right. Uh, they're always busy. They might even overwork or have too many hobbies, and that's simply to avoid intimacy. Too many hobbies, workaholic, you can hide from relationship that way. Uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, there is an a. They might even overwork or have hobbies to avoid intimacy. Um, workaholic. They could even say things like, "I would rather have a career than a relationship." I've heard people use the expression with me. Well, relationships are overrated. God's in the people business. You're in big trouble. <laughs> Friendships are overrated. God's only got one business, and you're a Christian. There's only one business, people. <laughs> it's not like, God, I love. It's these people I can't stand. All right? Anxiety and fear arises if the relationship gets too deep. That's when they run. And I've seen this 
in all the years I was in ministry, I was never in a, never had a congregation where I didn't have an occasional runner. Remember, remember the movie, Runaway Bride? That's a real thing. That's somebody that has a need, but terrified to drop the wall and have a real information. There really are runners in the church, and I worry about them in the church because they will cling to adventure. They will find socially acceptable excuses. Well, you know, I just can't be confined. I'm like, you know, I got to be free to, you know, go here and go there, and I've got to be free to, to hang glide, mountain climb, uh, s snow ski, uh, go on a cruise, uh, deep sea, and they can make it sound like they're such an adventurer, but in reality, you'll find that they run, they're like a runaway bride, they run from relationship. And it's kind of scary. Uh, for me over the years, I would have, I would see this show up in the way where the woman would be dead, hypothetically, could be the other way around, but I've seen it where the woman died in the wool, solid Christian, rooted, grounded, growing in the grace and analogy. She'll be attracted to a guy who's kind of a wanderer. Sometimes he's there and sometimes he ain't, but he's a runner. And they think, big mistake, I'm going to tame him. I'm going to... I mean, they did this with seventh graders, didn't they, Jennifer? We saw, we saw a little survey they did with seventh grade boys and girls. Girls, how many of you think you're going to, when God gives you, sends you a man, seventh graders, when he sends you a man later, when you're older, you're going to change him into your image. You're going to change him the way you want him. You're going to make that man. Boys, how many of you, seventh grade boys, how many of you believe that, that when you get married, your wife is going to change you? Ain't nobody, no woman going to change me. Right there you have, a, you have an issue that will have to be dealt with at some point in your life because there's two mindsets clashing and they don't work. Men, you need the change. Women, you can't do it. Only God can. Resolve that somewhere along the line in life. <laughs> All right. The next one. I already said anxiety and fear rises if the relationship gets too deep. You get too close, they run. All right. I would say anyone that's counterdependent probably won't come to me for ministry. They will run. Because right now, this is a little bit vulnerable, isn't it? They don't go for counseling for the most part. Oh, they'll go for assistance for appearance sake, but they won't surrender. And they'll get busy helping other people because they're so much more needy than I am. Hmm. They can make all touch, all physical touch, into something sexual to avoid emotional things like tenderness. That's where they try to meet the need illegitimately. Tenderness is not in their vocabulary. Um, you might even date people that aren't a good match so they don't fall in love and people they are a good match with as only friends. That's a counterdependent. The ones that would be a good match, you keep them as friends, distant. But the ones that are not a good match, those are the ones you go after. And I think I've covered this three or four times already. Instead of asking for support in relationship, they're more prone to complaining and sulking. The way I saw it as a pastor show up repetitively is, oh, I've been trying to minister to Susie. But, oh, my God, she's messed up. I can't help. Oh, da, 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 da. And I'm going, I'm getting worn out listening to you describe how you're ministering to Susie. I feel like ministering to Susie. I only believe in changed lives. Maybe you shouldn't be ministering if you never get any results. All 
a counter-dependent seeks to avoid anyone getting close enough, they're tempted to use them. Communication becomes tempered by a lack of trust. All right? So, in other words, a counter-dependent doesn't want anybody getting close, but if they keep going after them to rescue them, they, they see them as a target. This person could be used very easily. I'm not interested in them for a relationship, but I can sure use them. Is this starting to you get in the picture at least? Because we're doing overkill on the symptoms. I want to get to how do we minister to this. But here's what they will do. If they use them, communication is still lacking trust, then one of the ways is they're inter they'll walk away or avoid conflict or need to be right. All right. Conflict is in relationship, right? And you resolve conflict relationally. But if they get in conflict, they either walk away, give you the silent treatment, or they have such a need to be right, they will just argue the point, and being right is more important than the relationship. They don't trust others' motives, but instead often second-guess people. This is which, when you are not in a legitimate relationship, you've got a wall, you only, being you, you don't connect and you don't have authentic relationship, your discernment is going to stink. So you will read into the, what their behavior is wrong 98% of the time until it's totally unmistakable. Then maybe you might be right once out of a hunter. But you're, you basically, in your, your mind, it's a constant sense that the other people or people will always let you down. And again, they rarely ask for help, even if they're a people helper or appear to be a people helper. They will not ask for help. All right? Here's the inner world of a counter-dependent. Maybe we should... Most people have this by now, this page. Just a few key words. The inner world. What do we mean by the inner world? When they're not talking, it's what's going on in their head. We're going to teach you to think like a count. No. We don't... <laughs> We need to understand where they're coming from in order to be redemptive. All right? Their inner world is of a counterdependent. Uh, as a child, and this is important because this starts young. As a child, they were left to fend for various reasons for themselves. A counter-dependent can have a real uh, tumultuous mindset. They're going to be overly sensitive to criticism. I'm going to read a bunch of these, so just get the picture of it. An overly sensitive to criticism of, of others, even as they often criticize. All right? They're overly sensitive to criticism, but they have no problem criticizing others. Often hard on themselves, hate making mistakes, because we're getting into another part here. They hate making mistakes. They suffer an inner soundtrack of intense self-criticism. They don't relax easily. They can experience shame if they feel needy. If I have a, 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 even a legitimate need, I get, feel shameful that I have a need. And some are even taught that you're being selfish. All right? They're taught to be, not to be selfish growing up. All right? You can experience shame if you feel needy. You see vulnerability as weakness. So then, if you see vulnerability as weakness, sounds like you'd be a real great friend or marriage, wouldn't it? You would have to be business partners and have your walls and distance and use one another. That's the counter-dependent uses. 
They secretly suffer feelings of loneliness and emptiness. Loneliness and emptiness, and they might have difficulty even remembering their childhood. That's where the damage was done anyway. They were left to fend for themselves somewhere in childhood. And loneliness is, as a young Christian, I saw it as a spirit. I used to think loneliness was like sad. No, sad is an emotion, but I saw loneliness in the spirit realm. And God showed me that's a spirit that wants to isolate people. So it can start with just an emotion like sad, but it's going to put a capsule around you and it's discernible. There's people that have a wall. Maybe you've done this stuff. It's like there's a place you go to that isn't God, but there is a place where people go to where they withdraw and observe around them as if they weren't there. That is a demonic capsule, and if you stay accustomed to that long enough, loneliness will, be, will have its way and rule in your life. It puts a bubble around you. You might not be able to see it, but it's demonically very real. All right? And that's a separate subject. Don't we have an e-book on that, right, Jennifer? And it'll be in our next book. Um, but first of all, it's counterdependent. Why is it such a big deal? Because it can produce, often well hidden, feelings of loneliness. Because on the outside, they will be the life of the party and be friends with everybody and know nobody. Actually, it reminded me of a few uh, of my, my uncle and his best friend who are both car salesmen. They seemed like they knew everybody, but they were friends with very few, including each other. They had me checking each one. They were in business together. And they, they were trying to make me the little go-between to check on if the other guy was cheating. But yet everybody that came into the, into the uh, pizza shop where I worked, they'd go, hi, I don't know, they were from New York, so yeah, how you doing, Ralphie? And they'd go, oh, yeah, Ralphie, how you doing? And Ralphie leaving, they go, I hate that guy. You know, I'm going, go, oh, my goodness. And they were both like that. So I'm going... I probably have a bad image of car sale. If you're a car sale, I forgive you, all right? My brother-in-law's a car sale, and he's a really good man. And he trusts God for his, his, his business, and God's blessed him. All right, I, gotta, I have to redeem myself somehow. But really, there are people who act like they're friends with everybody, and they're friends with next to nobody. It's an external act. But the danger is inside there's a very lonely person, and they can hide it that way. But the way you can tell is that they, this loneliness can cause low moods. And even if it's hidden, um, they basically, their insecurity and everything can lead to depression. But there's the other problem here that I saw in the spirit when dealing with people in the church. And it even leads not only major depressive episodes from their insecurity, but narcissism. And I see that's what the Holy Spirit showed me before I read this and any of this kind of stuff. Narcissism was they're bigger than God. And narcissism can even show up in inferiority. Pride is pride, people. Whether it's in, oh, I can't do nothing right, or I'm hard on myself, or I uh, don't no, no. Yeah, but it's all about you. That's all you're talking about is you, 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 you. Pride is pride, whether it's inferiority or superiority, but most people would see narcissism as superiority. And like I said, pride will agree to assistance, but it will not surrender or yield. So the loss of empathy, uh, a false sense of superiority, uh, they cling to the notion that I don't need others, and others are not good enough to understand me, although I love that. I remember dealing one time with a guy who was having um, a sexual identity crisis, and I saw a demon of pride with my eyes wide open. It looked like a bald Humpty Dumpty, and he sat and he went like this. Now, that we're, we're, we were dealing with his, his sexual identity that he, and he went, and it tilted back just like 
Humpty Dumpty, and I saw a flash over his face, tilted back. Did you know that it has a lofty look, scripturally? And I worry sometimes about people. Don't I hope there's nobody in this room, nobody on you stream. But I worry about people that always do that. I saw newscasters when they're interviewing somebody. But that's a lofty look, all right? A proud spirit. But guess what? That demon did that right inside this man. And guess what he said? <sighs> I'm a complicated individual. And I said, yeah, but I said, you're a believer. Sin's not complicated. It's either rooted in God or rooted in, it's either rooted in pride, in Satan, or it's rooted in God, in humility. That's pretty simple. He didn't like that. He liked being complicated. I'm a complicated person. And he actually humbled and got some ministry just with that one statement. I don't see you as complicated. I think when it comes to the sin nature, it's very simple. Pride is rooted in Satan, and humility is rooted in God. Where do you want to go? He wanted to get into head stuff to show me how brilliant he was, and he was brilliant, but he wanted to be proud, and I'm not like other people. You see, it's what it says, clinging to the notion that you don't need others or that others aren't good enough to understand you because you're so complicated. You're not complicated. You're a tangled mess. I'll tell you what. You're so tangled that only God could untangle that mess. But guess what? He knows how to do it. So you can't get him to argue with, I'm too complicated for God. Huh? They don't go that route. So just turn it to God. When in doubt, in a situation to actually help somebody, go to the higher realm. <laughs> don't stay. Uh, you can't go back and forth with, from their level. So clinging to the notion, I don't need anybody because they're not good enough to understand me, can mean you develop an inflated sense of being superior, <laughs> which taken too far can mean you lose empathy for other people entirely. And they can still be a people helper, but they don't really have empathy for the people. They're doing that for themselves. Inside, however, there's a fear that their underlying security will be discovered. All right, now we're going to get into that more in that inner world. What do counter-dependent people think? I don't need anybody. Don't let them get too close. They'll just disappoint you. I'd rather be successful than have a relationship anyway. Probably some career people. Love is overrated. I don't need it. People just take, take, take and leave me drained. <laughs> it's not worth it. I'm too good for him or her anyway. Don't let your guard down. They'll just hurt you. He or she could never handle me anyway. Nobody can understand me. They're not smart enough. Now, this is in their thought life. This does not mean that if, if they're a good manipulator, they're going to say all these things out loud. This is what they're thinking in the inner world, in the darker regions of their mind, right? The connection between codependency and counterdependency, and unfortunately in the pastorate over the years, I've seen too much of this. Because they'll actually say, oh, they've got a nice relationship. That's not a nice relationship. It's actually a sick relationship. A codependent appears to be the opposite of the counterdependent. So they believe they need another's attention to have any self-worth. And they tend to manipulate by their smothering attention to their partner. Are we getting a picture of this? This is an awful lot of facts, right? But still, the point is, I want to teach you how to minister to it, that if any of this makes sense for you personally or for someone you know, most of the time we go, I know this person that needs this, all right, in case it's us, you know. Gee, who would do that? <clears throat> uh, the connection between the codependent and the counterdependent, they, it appears that even though they're opposites, 
they can attract. They believe that the, they need the other's attention to have any self-worth and tend to manipulate by smothering attention to their partner. Okay, but although it might sound like the last person a counter-dependent would choose to be involved with is actually a very common match. It sounds like I don't want a person, but yet when they see this person bowing down and worshiping at their feet, well, that's going to appeal to their ego, not to the relationship, not to the connection, but to the, after all, I am rather godlike. I can see them worshiping me. A counter-dependent person will initially be attracted to a codependent's apparent show of understanding and warmth. But then what are they afraid of? Afraid of exposure, though. So the codependents and the counterdependents so often are in relationships together because underneath the counterdependence, belief that they don't need anyone is a de deep desire. What they were missing here, there was a clearly a deep, a deep desire to finally be able to let their guard down and fully trust and love another. And that's why ultimately when we do the hierarchy of need, we, we, we emphasize trust because if you, you'll never know the love that you really long for and need if you can't trust first. It doesn't, it doesn't bypass trust. You couldn't even get saved if you didn't trust that God is who he says he is and you opened your heart to that love. You can't get it any other way. And people want it desperately internally but don't want to trust so you're, you're until that changes and how do you how would you change that lack of trust humble pride won't get it so because they both revolve around needing each other uh, whether that is wanting or avoiding it's not uncommon for partners in a dependency based relationship to switch roles uh, an example, a common example is after years of constantly seeking out and desperately needing that counterdependence attention, finally they gain the courage to say, you know what, this ain't working, I'm out of here. <laughs> and they step away from it, not used to such a move by a codependent, the counterdependent all of a sudden fakes that they're needy. Whoa, whoa, where are you? Where, where's my breakfast? Where's my lunch? Where's my, what, 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 I need, I need, I need. They will switch roles when they're not really like that, but they liked the homage and the honor and all of the attention. And this person finally trying and trying and trying and trying and then finally say, you know what? I've had it. I'm done. Well, that's a shock to the system, to the counter to go, whoa. You, you, were, you were so predictable that when that predictableness went away, you threw them in a tizzy. And so uh, they panic. If the codependent overdoes it and goes cold on the other person and shuts them out, acting like a counter, actually acting just like them, <laughs> this often causes the person who is usually emotionally aloof, the counterdependent one, the proud one, suddenly they're panicking to lose the attention they're used to and becoming, they become a needy codependent, they need, they need. This push-pull dance can go back and forth indefinitely. I've watched it in married couples in the church. And until somebody wants to be free, it goes forever. It goes forever. So, what leads to counterdependency? Now we got to get to try to get to some understand the basic, what caused it, and then bring the solution in. I think you got a pretty good picture now, right? You see these two people? They don't talk. They talk about codependent people, but they rarely mention the counterdependent. And that's why I wanted to emphasize it. It's in our teaching, but again, even in our teaching, the counterdependent is not promoted as much as codependent. Counterdependent is not as easy to recognize. Um, but one, this could be a childhood trauma. Something might have happened that instilled a belief in you 
that others can't be trusted. And there's situations in, your, in the childhood, and this is where it gets established early on in your life, um, and that it's dangerous to need somebody. I'm going to go slow on that because that would be worth taking notes on. In other words, something might have happened that instilled a belief in you that others can't be trusted. That would be primarily mom and dad or caretakers, right? If we're talking early, early on, they can't be trusted. It's dangerous to need them. It might have been a parent that left a person close to you dying. It could be abuse. It could be tragedy that, that befell your family. But counterdependency could also arise from the kind of parenting you receive from your main caregiver during the beginning of your childhood. Called attachment. Isn't that, isn't that your psychology term, attachment? The connection a child forms with the caregiver, and they've even later named it attachment, uh, the connection a child forms with the caregiver the first few months and years of life is extremely important, determining how they will relate to the world and others in the future. It sounds like all kinds of psychology, but this is where your character forms in childhood and you grow up. All right? And many have acted the same way from the time they were a little kid, and they're still doing it now. That tells me it's redeemable and that, that Jesus can do something with it. All right. Regardless, I'm telling you, the church is in a situation of turning the hearts of the fathers to children, children and fathers. That's not just a cute message, that it's a supernatural dynamic that's taking place for whosoever. You can be reparented, but most people would rather isolate themselves in the name of independence, and I don't need anybody. Nobody's going to control me and tell me what to do. But doesn't that sound like a, like a little child? Nobody's going to make me eat my spinach. Nobody's going to make me do that. All right. But I think when you're 50 years old and you're still talking like that, I think you've got issues. All right. Redeemable issues, however. That's the good news. So the connection that the child causes with the uh, forms with the caregiver is very important, determining how later they're going to relate. The parents are sensitive to the needs of their child, meaning that the child is likely to grow up able to manage their emotions confident in themselves, and handle relationships well. So it's important, the care that they give. That when you're sensitive to the child, when the parents make the proper, even, even emotional connection with the child, they're going to grow up and be pretty good on their own, relating to people. But your parental figure was not emotionally available, was unreliable or unresponsive to your needs pushed you to be more independent. This, this is where I would have been more counter had I not had, had it compensated for, both by my mother and God, right? My dad, his grandpa, my grandpa, my dad was invisible because my dad was illegitimate. My, my grandpa could never accept him. He could accept his brothers and sisters, but he would look at my dad, he would look right through him. He was non-existent and invisible. When I was born and later had two sisters, two younger sisters, my dad could see my sisters, but he couldn't see me. I was invisible. All right. So what that did for me at age nine, I had a job at 10, age nine. I didn't want to, I, just hand me the money and let me go in and buy my shoes in the shoe store. I don't want my friends seeing me thinking that I'm a kid or that I'm helpless. So you, you, that is the normal response to that emotional detachment. He was there, he was present, but emotionally unattached. All right? So, um, and in some cases, it wasn't just emotional attachment, it was you were in a dangerous scenario. A uh, dangerous scenario means I can't trust these people, and it might have even been physical abuse, you will develop what is known as avoidant attachment or anxious attachment style. So that even though a child should be able to need a parental figure, a child in such a situation will suppress their need for any kind of reliance on any kind of caregiver. I don't need them. It's safer to not need them. And 
In other words, you decide at a very young age that it's too dangerous to trust your caregiver and work to not attach to them. That's why when God ministered to me, uh, my mother, I really believe, taught me wisdom. She taught me boundaries. She taught me things. Even at an early age, uh, she, she was literally homeschooled me in that context, even though I was in a public school. She homeschooled me as far as relationship and people. And I saw early on that she had people skills, and my dad was clueless. He, just clueless. He was the absent-minded professor. Brilliant. But my mom would, be, uh, would stay at home, and she would tell him what was going on in my dad's engineering department. And then the stuff would happen, because my mom knew people. He'd come home and he'd go, how did you know? You don't even go there. How did you know that that one was, go was going to quit? How did you know that one was cheating? How did you know one of them committed suicide even? My mom says, he's dangerous. They're gonna, he's going he's gonna to do something horrific. My dad, oh, why do you say things like that? You know, she was always right. So he was always amazed. You're not even there and you know this stuff. She knew people. She had wisdom, actually. When uh, my mom was still alive, and Jennifer and I were first married. My mom, uh, my mom would, was sick and in bed. Jennifer would go down and just, she would just glean wisdom from her. She was just a person of wisdom. And it was all relational, whether, whether she was asking her questions about children or whatever it was. Um, but the one definition that's given in psychology circles for counterdependency is called the refusal of attachment. That'd probably be a good, a nice word that everybody would understand. Refusal to attachment. Think in terms, runaway bride. Could be a runaway groom. <laughs> Either way, it's runaway of to refusal to attach. And even if they get married, you can still refuse to attach. You can be two independent people under one roof, like a business merger. So this is why God in the spirit. Now we're going to get into spiritual. We're going to get away from the psychology a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. God, by the Spirit, told me when I planted my first church, here's how I want you. Not everybody's going to accept you as a father. Not everybody's going to accept you as a pastor. Not everybody's gonna, Two people call you pastor. One respect you as a pastor. Another one just because your title. And you're a pastor or somebody's pastor, not mine. All right. But God said, I want you to father them. And I was young as a pastor in my 20s, late 20s. And Yet he said, you've got a fatherly anointing and I want you to train a congregation for whosoever will because I found out real quick everybody doesn't want to grow. I want you to train them in four elements. Teach them their individual identity as it relates in the kingdom of God. Secondly, teach them their individual gifting. Because that, that gave them, telling them who they are needed to be acted out. Just like love without corresponding action and faith without action is dead. Gifting serves the benefit, any kind of gifting serves the benefit of saying who I am in Christ, there is something I can give to other people. He said, teach them individual identity, individual gifting, and then pay close attention to the ones that can move here because this is the goal of the church. This is the goal of actually mental health. The third one is teach them a corporate identity. And this can be two or more. This could be a husband and wife. Teach them corporate identity and corporate gifting. And to this day, That's 
that's my focus, and it's never changed from the time I was a baby Christian. I don't know if people are aware of it or not, because I can love everybody, but I'll tell you what, I know who I'm fathering, and I know who's going to eventually be gifted in the corporate expression. The example of a corporate gifting would be, first, God supernaturally brought me to Jennifer in a prophetic relationship. Hopefully all marriages are. But he brought us and said, when you join to Jennifer, you are a new creation, something that never existed before. And, be, and we're both secure enough to be our own person. Jennifer was widowed for many years. She did quite well all by herself. I did quite well by myself. And together, he made us a new creation. We entered into a corporate identity and the corporate gifting. By the way, corporate gifting is the fulfillment of your destiny. Destiny always includes a family or people or a kingdom mindset. Destiny includes people. Most people quit here, level two, and settle for success. You see that? For finding out who I am in Christ and what my giftings are, and then the goal of even bringing healing to people like this in the church is interdependency. That's maturity. Nobody wants to hear that because it sounds too hard or sounds somehow I'm going to lose my identity if I become interdependent. No. Spiritual, full stature, emotional health is interdependent people. You do not lose your identity. As a matter of fact, my identity exists Jennifer's identity exists, but just for two of us. God wants this for a family, not just two people, but that's the lowest common denominator for this corporate gifting. I learned stuff in the spirit that would have gone to the grave when I die if it wasn't for Jennifer. I know God's taught me keys that are benefiting hundreds of thousands of people. And that's not even exaggerating. Hundreds of thousands of people will be benefited by some of the simple keys that God revealed to me by revelation, not by intellect, but by revelation. However, they would have died with me had not God brought Jennifer into my life who had the ability to write it down and put it in a book. She could have been, she had an anointing for writing. Jim Gall laid hands on her one time and said, people have asked me to pray an impartation. He said, but I know God's telling me to give it to you. Big difference. And she could write, and she can write fast. She can get a download, and stuff just comes out. But she would have had nothing to write about. So you've got this wonderful writer with a gift to write. About what? Without me, she had nothing to write about. I'm telling you, that in itself should be enough reason for people to grow up and quit being such runaround babies. They will choose excitement, adventure, and to tell, me, tell you the truth, I think they're just running from a relationship with Jesus that is so solid and so secure. But I see it everywhere. You show me any 20-something, and I'll show you. Let's teach you to get rooted and grow up, or let's go do something exciting. And they'll say, God's leading me to do that exciting thing. And don't tell me otherwise. I've been in this too long. And like Jennifer says, I'm old enough now to just spill my guts. 20-somethings that are smart, that want to enter into the destiny that God planned before the foundation of the earth are not afraid of interdependence. They're not afraid of becoming something bigger than them. Most of your giftings, and I'm talking to 20-somethings now specifically, most of you, no matter how gifted you are, that gift would be better expressed through somebody else's vision, not just yours. But that's a hard concept because that would require maturity and interdependence, and they're afraid of that. There's a little counterdependent and a little codependent in all of us that needs to die. What do you think? We may lean more toward one than the other, but I'll tell you what, it's a work of the flesh and it's manipulation, and there's nothing manipulative that belongs to God. It all has to do. So I'm going to give you, this is Jennifer's statistics. 
this is what God gave me, and this is where God says, watch in your congregation throughout the years. To this day, I still look for this. We've got house groups. We've got house schools. We've got house outreaches. I tell you what, there's, some of those people are, are going to move into a corporate identity faster than people in Kingdom Life Church here locally. Simply because it's, a, it's, it's what passion they have in their heart to grow. But interdependence, instead of counterdependency and interdependency is what I should be seeking after. A healthy person does neither need people all the time or never need them. You know how I saw this in ministry? It was that I'm teaching you to stand on your own two feet. Anything I'm teaching you, guess what? You could do this too. But what I'm watching for is the time that you can't do it. Will you humble yourself and say, confess your faults one to another that you might be healed? That's not to make you sickly dependent. That's to show you so you're not so independent that you're no earthly good. In other words, guess what? You will never outgrow needing people, but you don't need them more than God. That's codependent or counterdependent. In other words, you have an anointing that abides within. You should be letting the Holy Spirit teach you to grow up. But if you truly are grown up, you're not just still running around looking for adventure and excitement and choosing excitement over maturity. Because maturity is basically saying, guess what? You might hide it as a counter-dependent or even a codependent. You might hide this. But the time will come if you want to grow, you're going to have to confess your faults one to another and be healed. That's why that's in the scripture. That's not to make you dependent. It's to make you realize that if you're going to be interdependent, somebody needs to have somebody to turn to in difficult times. That's why our house schools, house groups, house outreaches, I've making myself available to people who say, I want to be a people helper, but I'm not above inquiring if I'm doing it right. I'm not above having someone over me. Isn't it something? We've got people in their 50s and 60s that have no problem submitting to me as an overseer, as a consultant, as a pastor. But yet there's 20-somethings that go, I don't know, boy, I don't want no, no spirit of control on me. Hmm? It's funny that there's got to be there's got to be a chance to where we turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the and the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the wise. Luke one seventeen. If we are interdependent and we allow ourselves to be interconnected with others, we rely on them for some things, but not all things. We stand on our own two feet. We can allow ourselves to need things from others and at the same time knowing that, you know what, if they can't provide, it'll be, I'll be okay. If the provision's there, fine. If not, I'm not going to die. Well, that's why we're trying to, our next book is self-deliverance. What are you going to do when there's nobody around? What are you going to do when there's not a meeting? What are you going to do when somebody's not going bam, bam to you and laying hands on you and knocking you all over the place? What are you going to do? Seriously, grow up. Because you can only get so much of that for so long. And if they were doing their job, they'd be teaching you to stand on your own two feet. And by the way, family, quite frankly, I don't think anybody, unless they're 50 years old, is really competent to mentor anybody. Teach? Yeah. Mentor? Mm -mm. They don't have enough life experience. And what I saw in Chicago when I was a kid, you know what they call family? And this is the devil's perversion. What they call family was a gang. But it was kids raising kids. And that's what I see everywhere. I see kids raising kids, and they think they're in fellowship. No. Is there a father in your house? If you don't know who your father is, you don't know where you live, you don't know who your pastor is, where your church is, if you don't know that, there's something missing in your life that's actually quite serious. I've even heard him say stuff like, well, that's old church. <laughs> I'll tell you what. 
90% of what I preach is a little bit advanced than old church. Some things never change. God wants an army, a family. He's not, he hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't changed with the culture. He's, he's preparing a bride. He's growing a family. And he's equipping an army. But you can't have an army that everybody does what they want to do. They don't listen to orders. First thing I learned in the army is that guy has bars. It doesn't matter what his personality is like, whatever he says is going to go. And it's e take the easiest way you're willing to go works the best in the military. Now, stage one, the root of codependency, stage one bonding, codependence, ages zero to six months. Scary, huh? Zero to six months. This is Jennifer's facts here. I don't have any revelation on it, but I prayed with enough people to know childhood stuff, they form their basic character early. They form, they locked in, but God can change character. That's the good news. Bonding occurs through emotional attachment between mother and father and infant with the child. They learn trust and emotional intimacy. Fortunately, my boys were all crazy enough that if I stood at the bottom of the steps and they're at the top, and I, I said, they'd jump. That's a healthy child. When they're real little, somewhere there's an implicit trust, even if it's not rational. Don't jump. I can't catch you from that far away. All right? But that's a healthy thing. Identify. Okay. Do my parents hear me and meet my emotional and physical needs or do they neglect me? That will need minister to. But God wants to reparent, so that means I don't care how screwed up your natural life was, God has a plan. It's called the church. And he doesn't have a plan B, plan A, the church. And the church is capable of reparenting. It's just a question of whosoever will, because you don't have to. Right? So identifying the root of codependency, what did you want? What did you want? What are all the things you wish your parents or caretakers had said or done for you that they didn't do? Write that down. This is where we can minister. What? Did you want? What did you want them to say or what did you want them to do that they didn't while you're growing up? That's an extremely important question. If you're a note taker and we're covering tons of material, at least write that down because we've got to get to the healing part. What, and this, this you get in prayer. Don't just think about it in your head. Oh, I can't think of anything. I was only six months old. No. <laughs> what, in an attitude of prayer, did I wish they had given me or said to me? I wish they had told me they loved me. That's just an example. Or I, I wish they had given me birthday parties. That's not a small thing. If there's a, a big ache in there, there's a need that could have stayed uh, with you. You might want to make a list on a separate piece of paper even. What, what is it you wished they had said or done that they didn't say or do? Is that clear enough? Counterdependency. Six to 36 months. All the way up to three years of age. Is that right, Jennifer? Six to 36 months. Separation is the second stage which takes place from six months to 36 months. During this time, the child learns they can be a separate individual and still be safely attached to caregivers. Do my parents let me explore but still keep me safe? Or do they ignore, abuse, or hurt me? Do they let me just like a wild animal fend for myself? All right. Leaving and cleaving, all the way until you, even when you get married, leaving and cleaving is a thing that goes back and forth to be healthy. Like a baby, when it's a child, it nestles with the mother and the father and it feels connected. 
And then there's a stage where all of a sudden it pushes you away. It sees you've got a nose. I've got a nose. You've got a nose. They're making separation. They're making a distinction. At first, there's no distinction. I belong. I am part of you. Then they go away. And I've watched this with both my boys. And I'm sure everybody's child, they would go away and they push away to go do something. And then they get this panic attack and they come running back. That is normal and that's natural leaving and cleaving all the way up until you get married. For this reason, a man leaves his mother and father that he might cleave unto his wife. Leaving and cleaving is a healthy situ way of becoming healthy, interdependent, and independent. So independent in a healthy emotional way so you can become interdependent. Does that make sense? In other words, when you went away from them, was, the, was there a place for you to come back to? Or did they just ignore, abuse, and hurt me? What did you not want? This is the counter-dependent. What did you not want from your parents? What they did or said to you that you wished they hadn't? Because remember, this is the one with the wall, counter-dependent. What did they say that was hurtful or harmful to you? In other words, I wish they hadn't humiliated me when I had trouble learning to ride my bike. Uh, I wish they hadn't punished me by calling me names and calling me stupid and hitting me. You might want to make a list on a separate paper. What did you not want? What did they do that you didn't want them to do? Your parents or caretakers. What did they, what they did or said to you that you wish they hadn't? Things that were hurtful and harmful. Do you have that list? Do you have any ideas? Write them down. Do this later. But for the benefit of Ustream, I want to pray for people. I think right now that there is a, such a need for this, for both the counter-dependent, runaway bride, runaway groom, that type of thing. And by the way, it doesn't mean they leave you at the altar. That's just an expression. Obviously, they can leave you in the marriage and still be married. They just detach, okay? But the, the first one is in the lack of bonding. I've even reached out to people in love and freely gave with no demands or expectations and they interpreted that from me as a codependent thing. Th that I needed, I needed them more than... I'm going to say they couldn't even interpret it. They couldn't even interpret one-way love. I knew I was giving without any strings attached. They thought I had a need. But they were interpreting through their codependent or counter-dependent mindset. Counter-dependent at that point. But either way, but what you want to learn to do is freely give, freely release, do not demand, but ultimately my mission as a spiritual mom and dad, and this is the mission for anybody over 50 as a spiritual mom and dad, your goal is to see that they move beyond success. Remember, counter-dependent can make success their goal in life. They can be successful and be lonely, miserable, and jumping off of bridges. Successful. Because destiny always includes people. And your gift mix. What's beautiful about this is once a person can humble themselves past individuality and move into interdependence, their gifting that God had fashioned before them, before the foundation of the earth, there's a, there's a uh, convergence where all of a sudden it starts working. And you're doing what you are called to do because you're part of something bigger than yourself. And, you're not, and it's not frightening to you. So let's, let's, let's assume that we've got people watching by Ustream or listening to the CD or the DVD or what have you, or you're in this room. What is it they said or did that you don't want? 
here's what I want you to do. You have a legitimate need and they didn't provide it. Nevertheless, if I'm going to teach you how to get that need met legitimately by God, you're going to have to release forgiveness and of demands and expectations. If that doesn't turn off, if you want to go get it, Rebecca, you know the code. Let's release the demand and expectation. All right? How many have a list? You have something? Something they didn't give you. Then, Father, right now, you just drop down in your spirit and I release the demand and expectation. I, oh, this is going to help so many people. I'm not surprised the alarm went off in the middle of it. Uh, release the demand and expectation. Because in most cases, I wanted something from them they weren't even capable of giving. Isn't that true? Maybe they should have, but they were not capable. They never got it themselves. How can they give you something they never got? I release a river of loving forgiveness flowing out right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I release the demand and expectation. Now, if you release the demand and expectation, you can drink in and receive as a gift. There's room now. There wasn't room no matter how bad you wanted it. I want to receive whatever that was that I didn't get from them. I'm going to receive it from my Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ my Lord. I am drinking in right now. I am drinking in from the divine nature, Jesus himself, all that I needed and never received. Doesn't that sound nice? All that I needed and never received, I'm receiving it righteously by the Spirit of Jesus. I'm receiving it now righteously. All that I needed and didn't receive, I'm receiving it right now. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Now the counterdependent. What did they do that you didn't want them to do? Were they overbearing? It was perfect timing right during the prayer. <laughs> right? Counterdependent. Means that they did something you didn't want them to do. What was that? How many have something? If you're watching by Ustream, write it down. What did you not want? What are the things your parents or caregivers did or said that you wish they hadn't? Hurtful or harmful words? Write it down. Actions or words that they did to you? Did they micromanage you? Did they, were they overbearing, controlling? And here's what I want you to do. I want you to let a river of forgiveness flow out to them. While you feel what it feels like of what that yearning of, of, of not wanting, you wanted to put up a wall. Many of you have a wall down in your gut just thinking about it. That wall's been there for your entire life. What God wants to do is he walks through those walls. He walks right through those barriers and he wants to remove them. You drop down to your spirit and out of my belly flows a river of loving forgiveness toward them for what they said or what they did and it right through that barrier until it changes to peace. And until it changes to peace, no more barrier, no more wall. This is going to break that, that demon of a capsule that's around your life as a counterdependent. Nobody's going to get close to me. Nobody's going to, uh, no, no intimacy. God said, you needed intimacy more than anything else. You need me. But until you remove that wall, there's not even room for me in there. So, Father, right now, I release forgiveness to whatever that caretaker gave. Whatever they said or whatever they did to me, out of my belly, there's flowing a river of forgiveness till it changes to peace. That's the supernatural indication that I'm free. Now that I'm free and I feel, I've made my peace with that issue, I drink in the tender mercies of God and let, let God speak what he thinks about me. Let him reveal his love and his care for me. I want his words. 
my, my Jesus is going to have, and my loving Father is going to have the last word here. I want his words bathing my spirit. What does he think about me? I believe that he's basically going to comfort you with words. He's going to surround you with his love and embrace. And his presence is the only thing that beats you surrounding you. Just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord is going to surround his people. You don't need a capsule. You don't need a rejection capsule. You don't need a loneliness capsule. You don't need walls. Any wall other than the peace of God is demonic. Any wall other than the, other than the peace of God is illegitimate. Let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. That's the only wall. Let the Lord be your fortress. Let the Lord be your helmet of self. Let him be your breastplate. Let him guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. You don't need walls to protect yourself anymore. And now I yield and humble myself to a deeper, more intimate relationship that's genuine. No more, no more living like a chameleon acting the way I think people want me to act. I want to pray specifically for that, that that uh, chameleon thing is a learned behavior that comes out of that shell around you and that fear that anybody will see the real me. If they see the real me, that's usually the voice that goes with it. If they see the real me, they won't like me. So Father, we renounce that lie and from the place of peace. What is the truth? The truth is, I am what I am by the grace of God, and there's, a, there's nobody else like me. I am loved by God, and I belong. And because I belong, I've got a lot to give. That's a, the reality for the corporate expression. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.